All right, everyone, we should be live here. Hopefully Google's technology is uh, keeping up with the times, and we are live. Um, as the viewers come in, uh, feel free to just listen in, and we are definitely taking plenty of uh, questions on the Hangout today. So you can ask questions on the link that you may be viewing this on, on uh, Google+, or on YouTube, or on newgradoptometry.com. Um, so we'll kick it off and, and go ahead and introduce everyone. My name is Dr. Matthew Geller. Um, I practiced in San Diego prior to starting newgradoptometry.com, an online resource for newly graduated optometrists, uh, free resources and content uh, to help new you know, optometry students cross the void from student to new optometrist. Um, and that also led on, into us developing uh, a sponsor for tonight's webinar, uh, covalentcareers.com, which is an online platform to help uh, healthcare professionals find jobs and opportunities in healthcare, specifically eye care in this case. Um, and so definitely check those sites out uh, if you're both in the need for resources and kind of reinventing your career and uh, starting starting anew as an optometrist, but also in the segment of jobs and uh, you know kind of career advancement and career success. So we have some awesome people, docs, future docs on the webinar tonight. I'm going to go ahead and introduce them. Our moderators are going to be uh, um, Faiz Mahau, uh, Mahagwab. <laughs> no, I butchered your last name. I'm sorry. No sorry problem. about that. Um, and uh, Faiz is a third-year student at Western University College of Optometry. Awesome guy. Um, his overall optometric uh, interests are in developmental optometry and practice management. And he's currently serving as uh, the national president uh, of the National Optometric Student Association. So really, really overall just a tremendous guy. Um, Faiz and I have gotten the time to talk on, uh, on phone calls before, and he's uh, going to be an all-star for sure. In addition, we've got Allison, and um, Allison is uh, just a wonderful uh, individual. She's a fourth year at Midwestern College of Optometry and currently on her rotation at Providence, Rhode Island, um, president of the school's private practice club and uh, you know, active in the COVD club uh, as well as uh, in SPOSH. And uh, in the long term, she's hoping to open her own practice and uh, incorporate VT which Allison, by the way, Dr. Perot is going to be your, your gem for tonight in terms of advice for that. So drum roll for the main individual here. Uh, Dr. Perot owns a thriving practice in Wichita, Kansas, specializing in primary care, pediatric optometry, and vision therapy. He lectures nationally and internationally on behalf of the American Optometric Association and College of Optometrists and Vision Development, COVD. In addition to advocating for a profession, Dr. Perot enjoys being an educator and currently serves as adjunct facu faculty of, uh, North, of the Northeastern State, uh, of, excuse me, at the Northeastern State University College of Optometry in Oklahoma, the University of Missouri, St. Louis College of Optometry, and Illinois College of Optometry. Uh, overall, Dr. Perot is passionate about helping students and young optometrists learn how to get the most out of their careers while serving their patients and strengthening our profession. He believes that the best way to ensure success of the profession is by investing in the success of uh, you know, our young and future optometrists. So a little bit of a canned uh, prelim here, but you guys will see it's going to be a super organic and fun, uh, very interactive talk. Uh, the topics we're going to go over will be about patient communication, written and oral side of things, uh, but also the financial aspects of practice and debt management, which is a really important topic that comes up and uh, something that can actually be really scary for us as new graduates. Um, developing clinical guides and overall success in practice when it comes to both uh, taking on challenging cases but also clinical flows within your practice and marketing and advertising. Those, uh, those two kind of words that we don't think of ourselves at, 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 as, uh, as optometrists but are super important to success both in corporate practice, private practice, whatever that might be. So I'm going to take a sip of that water. Faiz, I'm going to hand it over to you. You can go ahead with the first set of questions here. And um, yeah, go ahead. Let's have some fun, guys. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Dr. Geller. And I'd like to start off with our uh, first topic and a uh, question about communication with patients. Um, I've often heard that you know, being a good communicator can really make a difference uh, in any modality of practice between you being someone that is just another person that does an eye exam or you being someone's doctor that they go back to and bring their family to. Um, so what have you learned over the years, Dr. Pro, about patient communication and really connecting with your patients? Well, it's a great question, please, and actually one I don't think the optometry schools give quite as much attention to as they should. Not that they're bad, I just don't think that that's a priority they've really realized. 
Um, <clears throat> there's a saying you may have heard from your faculty or from uh, fellow practitioners. Patients don't know, care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so the emotional connection that you make with patients is really, really important um, and cannot be overestimated. In my line of work taking care of children, um, the reality is that moms are essentially always with the child in my exam room when I'm examining a child. So the capacity for you to communicate easily with mothers about their children really is critical. It's not optional. It's not a luxury that you should just hope you have. You, you really can't be successful without it. If you are successful communicating with the parent, uh, a very fun dividend happens to you, uh, which is uh, you may know that women statistically and mothers statistically make virtually all the health care decisions for their families, which means that if you do well with that ch child and that mother in that initial encounter, you will get the whole family, uh, typically husband, other siblings, maybe even sisters, brothers, etc. So it's a very big practice builder, far bigger than any mass marketing that you could do to be a good communicator in the exam room. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah, I think uh, communications are interesting. And, and one thing that I realized was tailoring your communication to the person in the chair. So, you know, you're going to get someone who's perhaps a little bit more socially awkward or scared to be there or to someone who's super outgoing. Uh, Dr. Perot, touch on that a little bit. How do we pick up the social subtleties quickly in order to make that exam not only effective and helpful for that patient, but also enjoyable? That's a great question, man, and one which is, I think, I think that's actually quite teachable, but it's also an intuitive skill many people have. And I, I, I run the risk of being uh, politically incorrect when I say this, but I really have to tell you that I think women and females have a much higher natural quotient of emotional intelligence than men tend to have, so I think men have to work harder to be sure we are paying attention to cues, facial cues, body language, etc., cetera, uh, than women do. But um, to, to address what you said directly, um, matching the tone of the person that you're communicating with is really important. Uh, quick example, I saw a young lady today for a vision therapy progress. I was taking over from my partner who has actually moved to another location in the last month. And uh, I reached out to shake hands with her, and she refused to shake my hand. She's 14 years old. And she said, I don't touch other people. That was the initial encounter I had with her. And I mean, like, I shake hands with every patient. I smile. I greet the patient. I say, welcome. And so I kind of had to reset my clock. I mean, there's a 14-year-old girl who just refused to shake my hand. So I backed off a little bit, and I kind of toned it down a little bit, and I thought, I need to get back on this girl's wavelength because I really do want to connect with her. And in a few minutes, I felt like I was kind of, I had her laughing. Laughter is always really a powerful way to break down people's anxiety or their barriers. And uh, I think we did really good. Uh, but that's an example of something I have to tell you I don't encounter very often, is having someone refuse to actually shake my hand. So you have to really be willing to let the patient set the tone in the exam room, and then you have to match the tone so that they feel safe with you. You can't just have the same spiel that you do with every single person because that's you, if that makes sense. So I think that's a good, that's a good thought. It's a good question. Um, a key thing I'd like to add, too, that I haven't mentioned yet is we are the masters of a great, great big vocabulary of technical terms. These technical terms have absolutely no application in speaking to the patient. And in fact, I think in the optometry schools, because I do have student externs in my office, I have a residency, so I talk to students a lot. I've spoken with Faiz many, many times when I've been at meetings with him and visited his campus. Um, I think students occasionally get modeled behavior that's not good. By that I mean they see their faculty say terms like, you know, you have Fuchs dystrophy and your endothelial cell count is too low. Okay, I'm sorry. There's no human being that I know of that's going to respond to that, including a physician, by the way. If you had a physician in the chair, they wouldn't have any idea what you just said. So, you know, I would say in that example, 
the front part of your eye has a set of cells that act like water pumps, and your water pumps are not doing as well as they could be. That is exactly how I would explain what I said technically a second ago. The reason that matters is that it's very respectful of the patient to make sure they are understanding what it is that you need to say. It's not disrespectful at all. It's respectful. And when they understand what you're saying, they become your ally in, in terms of having you work together to manage their care. So don't use jargon with patients. That's just like commandment number one that I could give you, and you will never go bad from, that, from knowing that. Um, to, to shift over a little bit to the written part of this, I, I think the same principles apply. When I, so I've created, and I can share this with you guys if you'd like to see it um, after the, the webinar, but um, I've created, with the help of my resident, a really, really nice, very, very simple and understandable child vision report letter, and I can print it and have it waiting for my parent when they exit at the front desk. So it's actually hot off the press, and it actually is loaded with the child's history and their exam findings. It tells whether the child passed or failed what I call the pillars of vision, which are focusing, tracking, and eye teaming. And they can take it with them, share it with the father, uh, a, a, a spouse, a teacher, etc. cetera. Um, and that is, it's written in just the way I talk. That there's no jargon anywhere in this letter. And it's graphical and colorful and very easy to read. How, so, how, go ahead. You know, that's, that's interesting. I like the, I like the tools or the specific tool you came up with and that the practices I've worked at or shadowed at or externships or whatever it might be, some of the most successful ones had these communicative tools or sayings or handouts, these things they developed on their own. No one gave them to us. So just to take a little bit of a detour, how do you find that creative time to, to listen to the patient's needs and develop these things? And, and where else do those materials exist outside of maybe just... You know, maybe it's in reporting the way their vision insurance works or the way a bill is delivered to them and, and how to explain what they purchased or whatever that might be. How do you figure that stuff out? <clears throat> well, Matt, you do that by, like you do everything else that you do. You do that by making mistakes, by having people misunderstand you and then realizing maybe I lost a patient because they misunderstood what I was trying to say. Or maybe a teacher uh, sabotaged a child coming into vision therapy because they had misinformation which I could have stopped from you know causing a, a problem um, so you, you, it's like everything else and at least in my experience you do it because it happens to you you feel frustrated that it happens and you want to do it better mm -hmm. and actually I have I have been on that quest to give a parent real-time information for at least 15 years I purchased a program I purchased a program before 19 or before two, the year 2000 where I could dictate directly, you know, which you guys all take for granted now. Like you can say to Siri, what's the weather outside? <laughs> so this was called Via Voice. It was an IBM program. I spent $1,000 on the program. It was a total failure. <laughs> it would not transcribe what I said. It took, you know, hours to train, and it didn't work. But that's how long I've been seeking to do that. Well, now with the integration of our EMRs with, you know, Word, you can just create a Word document, do a, a merge of the data from your record, and you're done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, but I have been trying to do that thing that I just told you about for over a decade. And I finally achieved it in the last 12 to 15 months. And so the answer is you just can't give up what you're trying to get done until you achieve what you want, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, bring that bring that back to the to the world I'm in now, which is software development, and uh, there's something here: um, software iterations, iterating on <laughs> small small aspects of your flow or of your system or of your code, uh, time and time again, to develop something better and better. And that's exactly what you did. And I think that's so overlooked at at a healthcare practice and an eye care practice. Where it's you know we we start an idea and if it fails we scrap it when really a failure is just a you know the, what what it's telling you the next step to the iteration. And well, so, and I, I'd I'd like to comment on that because I've heard that a lot and it's uh, here's my thought. You guys are much closer to your academic time than I am, but I believe that's because Matt people think of failure 
when you've been in school till you're 25 or 26 or 27 years old, and that's all you've ever done, what you define as failure is what school has told you is a failure. So if you're trying to get into optometry school and you're taking organic chemistry too, and you're failing organic chemistry too, you're not going to get into optometry school. It's just that simple because optometry school won't accept you if you haven't passed organic chemistry too, right? Okay. So that's a failure to you because you don't get a passing grade on an organic chemistry final or a test, okay? Real life and practice has absolutely no relationship to that definition of failure. Real life and real practice is I've tried to do something which did not give me the end product that I wanted. Now I have to, I have to retain what was working and do, as you said, an iteration that will clean up what did not work. Mm-hmm. And you, you never fail in real world in the real world like you fail a class in college. It's not possible to do that. But yeah. but many people who have been in academics their whole life think of failure as well. I tried private practice. I didn't make as much money as I wanted, or I didn't have as full a schedule as I wanted. So I guess I have failed in private practice. No, you haven't. You just haven't turned the right knob, the right direction to make it work the way you want it. Yeah, I like your reference to knob turning. Um, <laughs> it, that guy in the back there, he's, he, he does the marketing and he, he turns the knobs on the platform until we get the, just the desired result and then we go, that's it. But we make yeah. sure we got plenty of knobs to turn yeah. so that, so that you, and you can build and measure and, and learn over and over. But uh, yeah, it's a good topic. Allison, why don't you ask the next one? You know what, you go for it. Okay, you want me to? All right, let's yeah. do it. Um, let's see here, what do we got? So, you know, transitioning a little bit, you know, let's go over some of the financial stuff. Um, when it comes down to the financial situation of the average optometry student, new graduate, we're we're in debt. We have student debt. Um, you know, I've got I've got over six figures in student debt, and it's really common. Some people have more, uh, you know, up, upwards to almost two hundred thousand dollars in student debt, but it, Beginning with that thought, what's the one thing we should have in mind when thinking about student debt? I mean, how should we reflect on this? It's just overall the sentiment that we feel about it. Is it something to be feared? Is it something to uh, to use to our advantage? How do we reference this in our minds, Dr. Perot? Okay, so, Matt, this is, I, I love this topic almost more than any other because it's so easy, in my opinion, to get you into a mindset where you can handle this. And you hit the major. You hit the major word, and that word is fear. You can never successfully manage money and finances when you are afraid. Period. Full stop. If I just if you signed off now, then you would get everything from that that I wanted you to get. You cannot address money and debt and financial success from a perspective of fear. And the reason is when you're afraid. We've all had pharmacology, we know that the brain state that a person who's afraid is in is an irrational brain state. If you'll pardon me for diverting for a minute, one of the most frightening things about the political campaign we're in is that there is an intentional use of fear on the part of the candidate, a major candidate, which is getting people to turn their brains off and just think from an animalistic Viewpoint that's terribly dangerous in elections as well as finances. So you can't be afraid and do this job at all. So you have to step back and go, well, if I can't be afraid, how am I going to stop being afraid? And the answer is by being smart. And the way you get smart is you learn about debt, you learn about finances, and you learn about money. And the more you learn, the more you use your rational brain and the less fear you have. Mm-hmm. Money is nothing but a tool. It's no different than a phoropter, a lamp, a, a, an OCT instrument. It's just a tool. So don't be afraid of tools. Are you afraid of your OCT instrument, for heaven's sakes? I mean, for crying out loud, you're not, right? So now having said that, um, you have made a very valuable investment by buying an optometry education. And that was, a, that was and is a good reason to go into debt. So there is good debt and bad debt. This is another thing people confuse. If you're buying boats and Rolexes and, you know, 
you buy margaritas for everyone in the bar because it makes you look like a great guy and you get a bar tab of $900, you're an idiot. I'm sorry. That's not a good way to spend your money. But if you spend 150 grand buying a doctor of optometry degree, which many of you are doing, that's a very, very good investment. We'll pay you back millions and millions of dollars in your career. I don't think anyone ever tells you this. Like, why wouldn't you spend $150,000 to have a 30 or 40 year career that will return five or six or seven million dollars to you, which is what you you will make as an optometrist? And I'd like you to consider thinking about it that way. Yeah, I so, think there's good debt, and bad debt. Excuse me. No, I didn't mean to cut you off there. The the lag is sometimes tricky to know when someone stops, but I totally agree with that. And I think the first thing that's coming to people's minds is, hey, wait, you know, I didn't make that much money, or I've got a story of X, Y, and Z person who who didn't make that happen. And I want to bring it. I want to bring the conversation a little bit more philosophical for a moment as to why that that's the case. And it's something uh, we learned about here in the startup that we're in. It depends where your focus is. If your focus is on the negative sides of optometry, on where uh, the tough areas to work are, and if you're constantly thinking about and focused on and, and trying to, in a way, be defensive of the profession rather than innovative, expansive, focusing on the money you want to make, focusing on the goals you want to have, innovating, bringing the right people on your team, it depends. What do you want to choose? And so I find that the people who choose this kind of negative side of thinking about things, who feel that the profession is somewhat limited and that they, they, they don't have this li unlimited mindset, they're going to get a, you know, the short end of the stick. and They're not going to be able to, to generate what you, what you said. But in the other hand, you've got the positive mindset. You've chosen to focus on increasing patients, increasing revenue, increasing your network, you know, uh, speaking, expanding your skills, and, and obviously you've learned a little bit of financial psychology as well about money and fear and those things and how closely they're tied and it allowed you to, you know, to enormously be successful. And so I think for anyone about to go into it, about to pay off the debt, um, you know, it's like that mentality. I don't know if you ever heard. It's like if you're about to crash in a race car, you know, you don't want to look at where you're about to crash because that's right where you're going to go. You want to stay on the track and focus on the direction you want to go when you're driving or when you lose control in the rain or something. It's the mm -hmm. same exact thing. What you focus on in your mind and your, you know, that sense that you can feel is what you're going to receive. And um, I think too many times optometrists, especially our profession, maybe it's the type of person that goes into it, chooses to get distracted uh, by the competitors or whatever's out there when they re really need to reshift focus on uh, on the positive things. And it may seem a little bit of a Tony Robbins book, but uh, in a way it is. But uh, look at Tony, successful guy. I mean, uh, the, the, that's really been verified by everyone who does what I do uh, or what we do, Matt. So um, my philosophy is I don't want to play in an environment. I don't want to compete in an environment where the rules are stacked against me. So, for example, I don't emphasize my optical department in my office as my primary uh, focus either for patients to see or for me to provide. I emphasize my professional services over everything else I do. In a typical optometry practice, 60% of the revenue still comes from optical sales and 40% from professional fees. In my practice, the building I'm sitting in, which, where my practice is, 70% of our fees are come from professional fees of our income, and 30% comes from our optical. So when Walmart or Target or a big box optical, Costco, has just come to my city in the last two years, I am not laying awake at night worrying about that. I'm just not, because I'm not playing in their end of the, of the field. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be because I don't really think I can compete against a multi-billion dollar big box optical corporation. I cannot. The fact is I cannot. But I can compete every day with my professional knowledge and my capacity to communicate and the professionalism of my office and the kind of technology that we have, and I do that. And I can beat the Walmart optometrist and the Costco optometrist every time if I can define the terms of how I want to compete with them. Mm. And that's not limited to me. That's not limited to me. It's, it's available to any of you guys who wish to do that. But you have to play smart. You just can't go, well, I'll just do two-for-one eyeglass sales. You didn't get a doctor of optometry degree to do two-for-one eyeglass sales. I'm sorry. That's a very poor use of your knowledge and time, in my opinion. 
Yeah. Allison, just a question, you know, being still in school, almost finishing externships and stuff, do you, do you guys feel that you're learning, like, do you, are you identifying the topics now that you're like, hey, I can really excel on this, or maybe it's like vision therapy, like you were saying, are you picking up those things now? Any tips to, to really retain the skills that, that you want to practice further on down the line you know, in your fourth year? How do you pick them up, know what you want to do, and, and uh, you know, what, what's going through your mind at this stage? You know, I think I'm learning the things that I enjoy and that I'm I'm really drawn to, and I'm learning that there are parts of optometry that I'm just not. For example, I'm at a low, I have low vision at my rotation right now, and I, I don't think that that's my forte. I don't do a great job with those patients, but then I have things like when I have a, a neuro case come in, I get so excited about that, and, and so I'm learning to, that I'm drawn towards what I'm enthused toward, and so that's what I'm going to keep working towards. Um, yes. It's a good point. Is uh, Gary Vaynerchuk? He's like another uh, real, real big uh, kind of business motivational guy. And you got to stick to what you know well. Um, there's certain things that we'll just never be good at. And to to beat your head against the wall trying to learn it just for the sake of saying that you'll be good at it isn't necessarily the best path. And so there's a lot of things in my role here or when I was practicing that it just wasn't for me. And and I didn't. You know, attempt to like, hey, I have to learn this for the sake of it. And school can be tricky with that because you got to learn everything. But in a way, you know, retain and know this is this is my deck. This is my this is my hand when I go out to practice. I'm gonna put down these other cards. These aren't for me. Don't need don't don't worry about needing to know everything. I mean, if I use you're taking uh, you're taking boards in a couple months. Good luck. It's a terrible time in my life. <laughs> but um, you feel like you need to know everything now. Um, any tips there, if I use, on kind of the way you're you're preparing for this stuff, or, or the way you're like internalizing some of that? I think you're on mute there still, actually. So if you wanna quickly unmute yourself, there. Yeah, you sorry about that. So okay. yeah, actually, the way that I'm kind of planning on uh, approaching the situation is first uh, with externships. Um, so actually, in about a week or two here, we'll actually be selecting our externship sites, and uh, I know some of the topics that I've kind of gravitated to towards the last two years, and um, I'm going to be definitely selecting sites that I feel like will give me a good exposure of what it's like to be day-to-day uh, -day in those environments. Uh, but at the same time, I'm going to be selecting some things that are maybe not you know, my main interest, but with people that I know can kind of complement the skills that uh, I'm interested in. So you know, doing private practice sites because I'm interested in private practice I think will help me get insights on uh, what I can do uh, in private practice. Um, so, you know, I'm trying to keep my mind open, but I also feel like I'm really kind of drifting a little bit further towards what I feel like I'm pa most passionate about in optometry. Um, and so we'll see how things go with externships and potentially maybe uh, even uh, residency after if I feel like I still want to get more of that core knowledge. Yeah. Yeah, totally. That's a, always a big question, residency versus not. Well, let's close out the finance topic really quick. Um, Dr. Port, I'll let you do it, but I just want to say, you know, when it comes to the logistics, like, what do you do with tax? What do you do with a financial planner? Do you refinance loans or not? Um, these are like all these little technical things which you can string up a Google search and find your answer pretty quickly or contact, you know, I'm sure you've got uh, someone who's becoming a CPA or becoming a CFP. I mean, you know, ask your friends, ask around. You'll find the answers to that. But the thing that you can't, the thing that isn't available in a Google search all the time is like that inherent knowledge of, uh, of like, I will be successful, I will make it through this, you know, I, or not even like I'll make it through this, but I already am getting through this and having that core belief inside. You've got to start practicing that now, even at the student level um, when you guys are still in school. That's the hardest part about all this. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Pro, you want to close out the finance topic and then we'll, if I use yeah, you, I would make this comment that we are specialists, we know technical things, and we tend to view the world for, through our perspective. What I've learned about finances, accounting, financial planning, things like that is that there's really no one who's ever going to be as interested in your financial success as you, whether they're a CPA or a CFP or anything else. So you have to spend the time, and it's worth investing your time, to learn the basics of how to invest in your retirement account, how to avoid being, you know, paying too much in the way of fees when you do purchases in the stock market or whatever, uh, how to do accounting. Uh, one of my pet topics is just the, ca the capacity to read your own financial statements that run your own business 
95% of optometrists cannot read their balance sheet and their income statement and know what it means about their business that they own. And that is not forgivable because the knowledge you need to know basic accounting is way less hard than it was for the sciences that we all took to become optometrists. But people tend to think, oh, I can't understand that. It you know, has to do with tax law or my CPA you know, speaks a language I don't understand. That's ridiculous. And by the way, if, you, if you're really ignorant in those ways, you put yourself at risk for embezzlement and being taken advantage of in a way that's very, very hard on you if it happens to you. So I would, I would encourage everybody to invest the time to learn the basics. You don't have to become a master, but to learn the basics of personal investing or of accounting or things like that so that you aren't just a complete victim to, to experts in that way. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, check out, like, I'm not sure, maybe Khan Academy, K-H-A-N, or any of those free resources. Yeah, Khan Academy's got something, or... You know, um, if you got you know uh, an accountant in the family, take him out to take him or her out to coffee, ask them questions. But yeah, the the three financial statements that you want to start looking at, even if you just Google examples of them in the balance sheet, uh, mm -hmm. the cash uh, the cash flow analysis, or it's really in order, kind of the balance sheet, the P and L, or the income statements got two names, and and your cash flow analysis of what's your runway. If you know mm -hmm. those three and how they tie into each other you're well on your way and probably surpassing a lot of people um, who will be, you know, essentially, I don't like to use the word competitors too much in care. We're kind of all friends, but the people who will be in the same business line you guys are. Mm -hmm. um, Faiz, you want to do the next one? Yeah, absolutely. So I wanted to introduce the next topic, which is developing clinical guides uh, and processes for success. Uh, and also maybe on the practice management side, um, developing some things where you can be consistently good. Um, you know, as a starting out as an optometrist, you don't have that experience of 20 or 30 years. Um, how do you go about incorporating some of those processes that will allow you to be consistently successful? That's a great question, and I've thought about that a lot, and I've been teaching students in my office since 1999. I've taken about, about uh, almost 80 externs now, and then I also have a residency. But um, here's a really fast one that I developed that you might laugh at, but it's very, very helpful. If you have, for example, a 30-minute time slot to examine a patient, and remember, I'm a pediatric person, so I'm going to talk a lot about kids. Um, I also do neuro and rehab and stuff, too, but just, just bear with me while I take you through this. If you have 30 minutes to do a clinical encounter with a patient, you should have the clinical testing done that you need to do in 15 minutes. And the reason you should do that is that that leaves a very nice, relaxed time period <clears throat> excuse me, to discuss with the parent, in this case, what it is that you have found clinically when you did the exam. Okay? So when I left school, I went to SCCO, a super good school. I was very well, well trained. I had superb faculty, etc. But I left school with the impression that the best optometrist that would check a child and do the best exam on a child would be the person who did the most tests that took the longest time and that that would somehow make me the best children's optometrist. And I practiced that way for a, probably a year or two after I entered practice and I realized the parents did not care if you did another visual perceptual test on their child. They just didn't care. They didn't give you points for that and you were beating your brains out doing all these tests and then you had so much stuff to explain you didn't have time to explain it and then pretty soon the person was out the door. So I realized it made a lot more sense to prioritize the testing and get really good basic data <clears throat> and then have time to discuss with the parent. This is what I found. This is the implication of what I found. If I found your child has a convergence in insufficiency, I'm going to talk to that parent at length about what that could mean to, to about schoolwork, homework, athletics, the child's self-esteem, and when they're done, they should have a really broad understanding of what it means to have a child that has a convergence insufficiency. Um, so as funny as that might sound, um, I've just asked you to cut the time in half that you were given to take care of your patient. By that I mean to acquire the clinical information that you need. Well, how do you do that? You don't do that by just working. You don't do that by cutting corners and not doing things you should do. You do that by working very smart and you do that by having a staff in your office that can do a lot of the testing for you and you can just manage the test results and the data. So, you know, in my uh, uh, office, when I arrive in my exam room, I have a suite of 
pretest information that's already loaded into the record. I have the history taken on the patient. I have a quality of life survey, which if you know what that is, is a survey COBD created about children and their vision and learning. Um, that's all sitting in the record when I arrive in the office and I can scan that very rapidly. Uh, and then I do what I call the pillars of vision, the three pillars of vision, up close, focusing, tracking, and eye teaming. And I can get the three pillars of vision checked very, very relaxed uh, time frame, six or eight minutes on a, on a, t a typical school-aged child. And uh, so, I, and I'm not, you know, uh, as, with due respect to the core of our profession, if you have a child who's 20-20 in both eyes, I have an autorefractor that's a state-of-the-art autorefractor in my pre-test room uh, that's sitting in the record when I arrive. If that autorefractor says plus a quarter, minus a quarter, some axis, and I have a child that's 20-20 in each eye with no visual complaints of distance vision, I do not conduct a distance refraction, subjective refraction on that child. Why would I? I'm not going to prescribe a lens for that child in the distance anyway. I come in, pull the phoropter up, and put the phoropter arm down and immediately begin the task of assessing the near pillars of vision. Well, I save minutes and minutes of time compared to what you may have learned to do at school by saying to that poor child who's plus a quarter, minus a quarter, now which one of these is clearer to you? Do you see what the folly in that? Do you see how that makes no sense to put that child through that? So I figured that out a long time ago. And I do a very thorough set of refractive data <clears throat> at near, which is where I want to know how that child is functioning for school and life. So that's a quick example of a clinical guideline that I just evolved over time where I thought, I need to save time on things that is not productive to me and what I want to get done. And then I can expand the time I have to do the things I want. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. It's really similar to, you know, when I was doing, when I was practicing pediatrics and, and VT stuff was the biggest practice builder for us. And so it's a patient population I saw pretty often. Um, and, and in a way, I want to defend this, not that you're bashing on the schools here, but you have to understand the school mentality. There's a lot of students there. There's a lot of people to check. That's why the Scantron was invented in multiple choice, because it's easy to grade things quickly and you can pack a lot of lessons in. And yep. that kind of carried over into, into our, our, our testing of, and learning of procedures. We learn the basic rudimentary blocks, but, and, I, and I hand it to the schools, they don't have time to look at the exam style and flow of every single student out there. And so you learn the basics of what you need, but yet I think the message of, hey, take this and do what you want with it later is sometimes lost. Right. And I thought when I graduated, there's only one way to do an exam, there's only one way to do a test, and I found that that was totally not true. There's a million different ways, and it's got to work organically with your flow and with your office, but, you know, time for me was the biggest worrisome thing when I was a student. I was like, how am I going to do this? You know, there's no way I could do it in five minutes. I'm sure there's people laughing, or, you know, what they watch this later, they're like, 15 minutes, that's crazy, but trust me, it's totally possible, because a lot of the stuff you don't need to do, and you'll develop your own flow. Um, but it's those those ways are set up for easy grading, easy critiquing, judging everyone on an even playing field. If everyone had their own exam style, grading would be unfair. So you got to standardize things. Um, well, and you, one other point, Matt, to follow up. So another fallacy I feel like that I was taught in school, and I think it's still being taught, is you don't have to acquire all the data on the patient at one encounter. You just don't. And if you have a lot of data to acquire, you can do return encounters. So. When I've got those pillars of vision checked, I may still need a visigraph, I may still need visual perception testing, I may still need accommodative facility or other tests I have not yet conducted. They're going to be done on a return visit. And I, I never have parents object to that. I've gotten the basic core information for them. I've begun to communicate with them about how I can intervene to help their child. And they're fine to have someone come back on another occasion for more testing to fill in more blanks. Yeah. It's a huge fear of ours is to say... Oh, go ahead, Allison. I have a question for you as well. So with so many new doctors, and I'm learning there's so many, that's the phase I'm at, learning there's so many ways to do one exam, what are some checks and balances that you have in your practice to make sure that, that things are staying consistent between doctor and that little things aren't falling through the cracks in your practices? Well, one of them is, for instance, in my electronic medical record, I color code the core things that I must complete, and I actually, because I have so many students and, and I have a resident, I'm not, can I don't, I don't always do the testing I just described for you. So when I start scanning that record, I'm looking at my color-coded um, fields to make sure those have been tested and filled in. 
that's one way I'm certain I'm, conser I'm uh, consistent. Um, and then again, on the communication side of this, as we talked about first, I want to make sure the parent has excellent understanding of what their child's situation is, such that they can even repeat that back to me prior to them leaving. Those are my core ways I'm going to make sure for quality control. Uh, Allison, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. If I use questions on that stuff, I'm sure uh, third year is presenting some unique opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, with developing your own style and, and kind of working into your own flow, you know, is there a way where you can kind of, um, you know, maybe it's a, getting in touch with a mentor or doing something else to where you can hit the ground running with that and, you know, not not feel like you're going to fumble through your first three years of practice uh, until you kind of work into your own flow? Is there any, any tips that you think uh, through working with the students that you have, the ones that have picked things up quicker and kind of grew into their own things that they've done? I think, you know, when you're at a good school and you have a trust relationship with even one faculty member in the area that you're interested in, I would take the person aside and go, you know, I've been thinking about my exam sequence or I've been thinking about the tests that we've been taught to do. And, you know, it, it, Matt's speaking to a very important point. As a student, you have a database of information you must master. You must pass boards. You must be able to pass your state exams, etc. But when you enter practice as a doctor, you really have remarkable amounts of freedom to kind of customize how, how you wish to do things. So I would be saying to your faculty, you know, I, I, you know, I, uh, I was taught, for example, to use the fused cross-cylinder test as a primary test to check near accommodative function. Okay, I used it for over 20 years, and I had actually a student in the office who said, hey, Dr. P, why don't you try near retinoscopy? I think you'll like it better, and I think it gives you better data quicker than what you're trying to do. <laughs> and it does. It actually does. And I don't use the fused cross-cylinder. It's a miserable test. It's really <laughs> miserable. It's hard to explain. People have ambiguous responses. Sometimes they can't respond at all. But when I do, when I pack, uh, put a DEM card on my retina scope, and I just say, "Please read these words," and I scope that child at near, and I get a direct reading of their accommodative uh, lag. That's so powerful and prescribable, by the way. And so that was a way I kept learning, and I was learning even from my students. But you can do the same thing, guys. In school, you can say to your faculty, "I'm trying to think about how I'm going to work when I'm in practice, and I'm trying to change sequences or imagine a creative way to do this." I think you'll find the faculty will be quite open to that and will enjoy talking with you about that. Yeah, especially, I mean, at SUNY we, we began to, you know, especially in third and fourth year in clinical years, we were graded on that kind of thinking. Um, so I think in the, in the, in the first couple of years, for second year, it's very much so, look, learn the basics and, and we'll talk about the, those avenues after. So Faiz, you'll really get into that now and Alice, and maybe you're starting to see that more now. It's like think with your own mind, you know. And you get it at the end, which is nice. Right. Allison, Allison, do you want to go for that last topic there, and then we, uh, you know, we've got we've got a little over ten minutes here, and we can just, uh, you know, end it on some organic conversation. But yeah, go into that last topic, Allison. Yeah. So our last topic is marketing promoting vision therapy outside of your practice. And so, what are ways that you um, are finding to? kind of increase knowledge of vision therapy and increase understanding and increase some of maybe the misunderstanding that's out there about vision therapy. Um, <clears throat> so I'll speak first to the organization which I hold dear in my heart, which is COVD. COVD has really emerged as the premier organization in optometry in the United States, and I'm bragging because it's true. And I didn't cause that, but that's actually true. Um, you guys may know I was lecturing in China two weeks ago. The knowledge base that you have as an American optometrist, you can't believe the hunger worldwide for what we know about neurooptometry and developmental vision, etc. Um, so first I need to tell you that you are standing so much higher on a basis of research and evidence than I was when I was at your stage. And that gives you power that you just simply, I didn't have. Okay. Um, second quick example, so about a month ago I uh, presented to a local neurology group, um, five MDs and four nurse practitioners in their practice. Um, they were unbelievably open to referring patients to us that are neuro patients. They know the visual sequelae of neuro damage, but they didn't know who to send patients to. Um, 
they were completely like there was no animosity, there was no you know well you're an optometrist and we're MDs. They were just going. We we had no idea you were out there. We didn't know you knew what you you know you knew. Uh, I showed them a video that a colleague has shared with me about an, a brain injured patient who was uh, was treated successfully with yoked prisms and vision therapy. Uh, they had a midline shift, and uh, that video, which is two and a half minutes long, it was just as powerful to them as if it had been like a PTA of an elementary school. They were like, wow, they couldn't believe the person was so damaged. And, and one of the neurologists, when the video showed the young man who was a hockey injury, and it showed him walking in this horrible gait, bent over sideways and acting like he was going to fall over, and one of the neurologists said under his breath while I was showing the video, we call patients like that malingerers. That's actually what he said. We call patients like that malingerers. And then they put the yoke prism on him and he stood up straight and then uh, they did vision therapy on him and he was able to walk straight without any yoke prism on. My point is they had no idea we were out there, we are out here and we have the knowledge and the capability that we, that we have. So your opportunities are the greatest they have ever been in the history of the profession to do neural work like you mentioned, Allison, or to do pediatric work like I'm doing. They're literally the greatest they've ever been. We have more evidence and more acceptance of what we do than we've ever had. And I look for that to only grow in your careers. So, um, so the first thing you have to know about marketing is that you're not just a snake oil salesman that's trying to get someone to buy something because you want to make money. Like, and I think many optometrists feel and students feel that, well, marketing is like this filthy, um, you know, undesirable activity where you're trying to force people or convince people or, or uh, you know, hoodwink people into buying products from you because you'll get rich. And, and if, you, if that's what you wanted to hear, then this is the wrong channel because you're not going to hear that from me. To me, marketing is saying what we know, promoting our knowledge, and then letting the public and our fellow professionals come to us because we are so helpful to them and their patients. That's what optometry marketing is about. It's not about two-for-one eyeglass sales. It's not about colored contact lenses. It's just not. It's about going, do you have a son who played football and had eight concussions their senior year, and now he can't learn in college? I fix people like that. And that person will come to me. Yeah. So that's really a very exciting thing to me because it completely changes the tone and the nature of what you're trying to do. I mean, Matt, you're, you're running a company, you're marketing, you're promoting your company. The reason you're excited and passionate about your company is that you're going to help ODs do something they can't do as well without your help. You're not trying to sell a product that you're going to get away with and hope the person can't find your email address when they find out you cheated, right? Yeah, you said it really, really well. You would have no future if you did that. Yeah, the, the marketing approach we follow, which I'm really glad you touched on it. I don't know if you read the book. Gary Vaynerchuk, again, jab, 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 right hook. Um, also a concept of inbound marketing, uh, really uh, memorialized by a company called HubSpot, is the, the, the marketing approach of putting out lots of great information and in the practice sense it's exactly what you did you educated that group practice of MDs and, and, and neuro folks and you put it out there you said here's everything it's like 99 percent of what you need to know but the one percent the special sauce that's we can work together on that we can build a relationship together on that and so you know as an optometrist you guys want to be out there doing an inbound strategy of putting out information into the world that's the jab, jab, jab. You're giving them all that. And then once in a while, it's not the snake oil salesman, but it's very authentically, this is what I have for sale, and I've given you lots of great stuff. So if you're open to it, consider it from me. And I'm, you know, that's a part about getting involved in your community and giving back to the community and showing yourself around and things like that. And then once in a while, you say, oh, and by the way, we do have these things for sale, which are optional for you, or feel free to get involved. It's not the bait and switch. Um, and, and that's a really popular, you know, Dr. Pearl, we were talking about millennials before, and that's a strategy that works well. That's why, you know, we, we pretty much gave away on undergrad and covalent almost every single thing for free, and once in a while there's a paid option or something like that, and in the practice, you know, through education, 
uh, both on the patient side or on the professional side, you're giving so much away, but then once in a while you, you go for the ask. And that's okay, and you shouldn't be shameful for the ask in any way. It's, your, it's what you put all your work and effort behind. Right. Does that resonate with you, Dr. Pearl? It does. And uh, so let me give you a fun little thing that we're doing, actually. We just did it last week. We have purchased a car, a brand new car, uh, and we are going to have the car wrapped next to the decals. They have our practice our website, uh, telephone number, which will have a special tracking number that we can tell just the camp in the car. Uh, and that uh, car is given away in one way. year to the person who refers the most children to uh, the most patients to our practice. So that car is going to be driven all around the city and the region by all of our employees. It's totally fun. It has a very playful aspect. Um, it's going to say on the back windshield, we help children read. And it has childrensvision.com, which is our nationally famous website. Uh, and we're just going to have fun with this. We'll probably generate two, three, four hundred new patients with that car, uh, and we'll give it away. And we'll have a big fun photo op when we give it away in a year. Uh, and it just it puts a sense of excitement and fun out to doing something uh, that, you know, how many optometry practices will give away a car? But you know, we've been giving gifts to our patients. In, in, in having referral contests for three years, and we're working with a marketing company that taught us to do this, we have generated 2,800 new patients in the past three years by asking people to refer to us, and then we give them a gift through a drawing once every quarter. And the gift is about a $500 uh, value. Our average patient revenue in our office is um, about $250 per patient of our primary care patients. Well, you can do the math quickly in your heads what 2,800 new patients times $250 per patient comes out to. And it's a lot of money. And it's fun. Like, there's no there's no snake oil. It's just fun. We're having fun doing this. So that's the kind of mark I enjoy, uh, where, I, where I, I don't have anything that's high pressure. I don't have pressure. I don't have it's uh, shady. shady. Uh, it's just fun. It's just patients fun. engaging patients. fun. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's, that's really cool to take things to a new level. And I was looking at your website, and you got the blog that's up, and it's something I was actually uh, authoring about right now is how to create a blog for your practice. And um, Can you describe to me what it was like in the very beginning when you guys were creating that and how tedious it may have felt, but now does it help you? Does it act as a referral vehicle? How long did that process take to go from when you started till now, and what was that uh, sentiment like throughout? It's a good question, Matt. I have to tell you, my practice website is is about almost 20 years old. The children are old, and that completely was created as a informational source, uh, and it's still in the top three. You put in children's vision, you get near in the top three hits that you'll get, um, which is really fun because we've been that had that presence for a long time. The blog, I love the blog. I'm less um, diligent about keeping the blog up. As I should be, so I have to tell you, it's my problem is finding the time to post the blog. Um, so I, it's but but the the driving of patients to our practice through the internet is ridiculous. We're now generating 28, 30 percent of all of our new patients are actually coming through the internet. That will only grow, as we all know. Um, and so having good information on your website, having it obviously be technically good, so People can look at it on Surface tablets and on smartphones and stuff too. That's been a fairly heavy lift because I started the website long before any of that even existed. So I've had to convert it to different languages, etc., to make it able to do those things. But it's not a burden to me. It's just finding the time to do it with all the other things I have on my plate. Sure. Yeah, and it's it's great to see you focusing on multiple aspects of 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 uh, you know bringing folks in and, and the internet. Certainly a powerful way to do it. Allison, if I use any questions on that stuff that maybe you're asked around in, in your class on, on topics of marketing and advertising that Dr. Pro or myself can answer, more specifically perhaps? Uh, yeah, so I have a question, I guess, relating to social media. Um, how have your experiences been in social media and interacting with patients and um, getting the word about, out about the services that you deliver um, and interacting with patients after uh, they actually come receive services and using, you know, online referral sources uh, potentially to bring in new patients. 
Um, again, I feel like we have a long, long way to go to get good at social media because remember, at my age, that was something that arrived long, long after I started websites, etc. I will say this, we are very up to date on, we use a, a, a company called Demand Force, um, so we text and communicate with our uh, patients very aggressively, like, you know, hey, Faiz, you've got an appointment tomorrow at 2 p.m., please text back why if you can keep your appointment, like we do that every day. Uh, we have the capacity to tell people your glasses or contact lenses are ready. We do all of that by texting, etc. So I think we're real good on that level of communication. Things like Facebook and having people like us and having a big group of friends and stuff like that for our practice. Facebook, you know, we're way behind where I'd like us to be, you know, uh, because that takes, again, time and energy that I have not been able to, to uh, do as well with as I'd like. I do have, I didn't mention this and I should, I do have, I actually have a full-time marketing director in my practice. That is her entire job to market the practice. So for instance, she's quarterbacked all of the issue of purchasing the car, hiring the decal company, all that kind of stuff to get the logistics of that done. Uh, so our focus is on bringing new patients into the practice with fun promotions. Uh, we have graded our sign on the street that's just to, outside the window to me. Uh, uh, three years ago, we put a $50,000 uh, LED um, marquee sign on the street. I have a very busy street outside my office. That's generated hundreds of patients for us since we put that up. We change the message on the sign all the time, and people drive by and see it. That's really cool. Yeah, when it comes down to the social media side, um, by the way, ours is made out of like foam board back there, so we need something new. But um, <laughs> startup, right? Um, when uh, with a Facebook side, if I use authenticity, transparency really plays a long way. You know, you'll get a patient who's shopping around for a doc, and uh, you know they'll go on your Facebook page and see that you have this authentic presence. Maybe you just had someone's birthday and you took pictures, and and just the fact that they get to look at the doctor and other than this professional photo that was taken, you know. 20 years ago and doesn't look like them anymore and they just get to see the relevance of what goes on on a day-to-day -day basis. We, you know, we found that the practices I worked at to be really successful. Just a, just a kind of poking a hole in the corporate side of everything and being able to look in and, and see what goes on. Um, that's a really good side to Facebook and I think some of the advertising avenues there are really for another topic but are great. Um, well, Matt, I'll comment very briefly. I have on my website what I call my Hallmark card video. It's two minutes, two, and a, uh, two minutes and 20 seconds. My son is a journalist, and he shot the video. But that is the entire reason I have that, and that is this is Dr. Perot. I'm going to tell you why I became an optometrist. I'm going to tell you about the woman optometrist who saved my bacon by you know, making me able to learn when I was a college dropout. Uh, it's an up-close of my face. It's got super high-quality audio and video. I'm sitting in my home in a with a library behind me. And you're going to know something about my voice, my face, and my personality without ever having to come here by just seeing that two-minute video. And I think everyone has to do that in this same time. Yeah. I want to end on a, on a question. I, I don't know how you're, you're going to answer, Dr. Perel, and, uh, but I, I have an idea of how you will. Um, and it's, it's something that's come up, and it's amazing to see the parallels in business and, and, and just in an eye care practice from the business side. Um, and, and there weren't that many questions, or I don't think there was really any questions who came in, so we can finish on this note, but how do you, how do you as a, either as a student graduating and about to go into your first position, or as, you know, a new graduate getting ready to embark on, you know, the, the deeper leg of their journey as an OD, say, like, it's to open their own practice or to buy into a practice, when there's this balance beam of, do you play it cautious versus do you invest and get a little bit more risky? Which is the general consensus of the way to tip that? And I'll tell you our story here. It's like we have a finite amount of money from cash flow. Do we invest that so that our runway is at like we can go broke next week but we spend all that money towards growth? Or do we say, you know, let's play it super cautious and let's actually tailor it back an extremely, you know, uh, give it, play it so we're, we're really conservative and we can last, you know, another year or two with no, with no problem, but, uh, you know, we may not grow that fast because we're retaining the money and saving the money and not spending on that. And so it, it, that seems more applicable in the new graduate investing in our practice avenue, but it's the same thing with the student. 
and, and what should they do? How should they play their hand? How should they play their cards? Do you go the little bit more risky route and invest that money? Because it sounds like, I mean, you guys got the sign, you got the car, you bought the marketer, you're probably in, it sounds like you're investing in things up front because you know they're going to pay off. How do you weigh that balance beam? I'll tell you the way we do it after, and then I'll tell you uh, an interesting story after from someone else. But yeah, go ahead. Take your time on that one. Well, it's a great question. I like it a lot, and I'm going to actually give you something. You obviously are reading heavily in the business and kind of inspirational environment stuff, and I like to do that too. So this is actually from a book I read called um, Adapt, How All Success Always Begins with Failure. That's the name of the book. It's a phenomenal book. Uh, I read it about four years ago. <clears throat> and this is from that book. So uh, there was a Russian engineer who I'm going to quote, and his name was Palchinsky. And this is what he said. In order for any business to grow or thrive, you have to innovate and you have to experiment. But if you play so much of your cards in, 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 a, in a particular way, you know, like I could have said, well, you know, I'll buy a Lamborghini for the car instead of a Chevy Spark, okay? And then I'll just hope to God that I get enough referrals to pay for the Lamborghini. I mean, I'm just kind of making a silly example. Okay? When you do the experiment, you've got to have an exit strategy that retains your life. Okay, you can't do something where you just go for broke, and if it doesn't work, you're dead, and and your business has failed three months later. That is very foolish, and I don't. I, if there are people who have done that, like Steve Jobs, or I don't care who, that's fine. I'm not wired that way, and I don't think you have to be. So you have to have a viable. If this doesn't work, and and remember, we talked about failure uh, a, a while ago. This de the definition of failure that I'm using is very different than what you're used to. Failure is not, I tried something, I tried a marketing thing and it didn't work. That's not failure. Failure is, I tried the marketing thing and I spent the entire, all of the cash flow of the practice for three years to do it and now I have to close the practice. That would be failure. But I would never, but I would never do that, you see. So um, that's my answer is I think you have to be cautious and prudent, but you also have to innovate and be willing to experiment. And so you're going to walk between those two extremes that you mentioned, Matt, which is I can't just sit here and go, well, I hope the business grows, and I'll pray and hope every day that that happens. you got to make stuff happen. But you also can't be so dramatic and so, um, you know, just spectacular that you look up and go, oh, my God, I tried something that was really, really big. I swung for the fences. And I struck out. Now I'm, I'm. I really have failed. I can't practice. I got to go get a job somewhere because I'm bankrupt. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. It's yeah, just middle course, I feel. Yeah, I think it's this kind of balance beam that's always going to one side to the other, and you're always correcting it in a way. Um, yeah, no, completely agree. And it sounds like you found that really good balance because you're able to invest in things um, that n normally potentially it's like not many I love the fact that you brought on someone to do full-time marketing um, Aaron Leck up in uh, Roseville near Sacramento California area same kind of thing he invests in positions of, of folks in his practice to create success down the line and I know him he's got definitely got an exit strategy should should it not go that way but the fact that um, you know you and him and you know the, the companies that understand this can invest in that confidently and that plan out the strategy should it not work out. That's key. You know, I hate the practice that sits there and just takes home the cash for themselves and lets their practice kind of sit there. Doesn't take risk. Doesn't uh, doesn't put money in it to grow or, or just keeps a you know a cash haven in the bank should something happen. It's what well, you're not really running a business at that point anyway. So I, I completely agree. You know when it came to our decision here. Um, it was interesting. We were deliberating over what should we do, what should we do, and we found that um, focusing on the revenue part brought revenue. And if that meant investing in revenue, we were able to generate that. But it really came down to what we what we decided to put our attention towards. Um, in our case, we leaned a little bit more on that balance beam towards spending in order to to get the growth. Um, but it definitely seesaws. Um, and I think for students listening, for new graduates listening, don't be fearful to to get out there and immediately start in a way being a little bit risky, but like Dr. Furrow said, have that way, that, that timely, very calculated 
kind of strategy to say, if this doesn't go this way, it's not going to end up in a complete failure. It's just a learning uh, you know, kind of expedition in this one exercise that I'm doing. Um, so yeah, really well said. I agree. Um, Dr. Pro, you want to close it out with uh, just in general, general comment here for anyone watching. Of course, this is available on YouTube afterwards for your complete viewing pleasure. And uh, YouTube hopefully will hold it in perpetuity for you guys to tune in whenever. Well, I want to thank you for inviting me to do this because part of my uh, passion at this time in my career is to try to give back so that you guys can have long and enjoyable careers like I have had. And I think the prospect of you doing that is higher than it was when I entered practice in 1985. So you, you, you really do have to be smart to succeed, but you're all smart or you wouldn't be through optometry school. But it's a different kind of smart than you have used to be an optometrist. And I'm sure you can relate to that, Matt, as, you're, as in your business. I'm a musician, and so I will say it to you this way. Um, a lot of what makes success, in my opinion, in business is the capacity to improvise, which is something all musicians should know how to do and, and, and have to do. And so you have to be able to play in a different key than the one you planned on or you have to be able to make do with instruments that maybe weren't as good as you thought they would be. That's just the nature of playing, and it's still fun to play. And so I, I would like you guys as new graduates to think you have a great opportunity in front of you, and you can have a really fun career doing very meaningful work, uh, have families enjoy leisure time. And there's, I really don't think there's any better profession than the profession of optometry. I really, really believe that. And I've gotten to live that. So I've had a great life. I've traveled. I have a family I love. I've spent a tremendous amount of time with them. And uh, I want you guys to have as much fun being optometrists as I've had. And you can. So when people say the market is saturated or they say, you know, it's just not like it used to be, that's really just garbage. That's really stuff you have to just let flow out of one ear because it's not true. And... Uh, you might have to work differently than I did. You might have to adapt in ways that I did not do. Fine. You still can. And you can have a lot of fun doing a, prof uh, a professional job that's very meaningful. Um, it's very flattering to me to realize that people in other countries are so hungry for what we know. And that is something to be very proud of as American optometrists. We really pretty much wrote the book on human binocular vision and now the implications of that in the brain and brain injury and rehabilitation. And that's not going to change either because the whole world is clamoring for what we know. So I hope you guys can really carry that torch forward. I know you can. I have great faith in your educations. The schools are doing a great job. But part of enjoying your life is to be independent, have the money and the time to do the things that you want to do. And that's what I hope for all of you guys. I really do. Yeah, absolutely. And for those interested in vision therapy and feel that a mentor would be helpful, we do something with COVD called COVD Match. Um, and you could just Google COVD Match or New Grad Optometry COVD, and you can find a list of mentors who are willing to help out new graduates in their quest to, you know, uh, be follow a role similar to what Dr. Pro is doing now. So, without further ado, I think uh, we'll conclude. But um, Thanks, everyone, for watching. We'll certainly do more of these. We can certainly uh, have Dr. Pat Perot back. Uh, Faiz and Allison, thank you for making this happen. You guys just called me on a Wednesday and said, let's do it. And uh, I'm really, really helpful, uh, really grateful you guys did. This was a tremendous talk. Um, difficult to moderate sometimes when there's this many people, but thank you guys for your contribution. It was enormous. So um, cool. I think we'll, uh, we'll click the stop broadcast button. I think we're going to remain on for a couple seconds, but uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.